enjoyed. If, if I were to ask you, what was the best part of your week? Over the last week, what, what was the best part? There might have been a lot of good parts. There might have been some bad parts. But, but what was the best part of your week? Well, I hope we would say when we got together for worship. When we gathered together on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, when we got together for worship and we sang together and we prayed together and we studied God's Word and encouraged each other, that, that was the best part. Now, there were other good parts, but that was the best part. And if I were to ask, what was the best part of your Sunday? What, what would you say to that? What was the best part? Well, you know, you might, might say one thing or another and, and no, you know, no slight to the song leader, to the preacher, but I suppose some of us would say when we partook of the Lord's Supper, that was the best part. When we remember Jesus' death and when we commune with Jesus by eating the bread and, and drinking the cup, when we thought about His sacrifice on the cross and what He gave for us, that, that was the best part. And again, no, you know, no slight to any of the other things we do, but, but that might be, for some of us at least, the, the answer that we give. I want to talk about the Lord's Supper today. And I want to talk about what we have just done and what we do as we observe every week and what we hope to do in the future as we observe together. Sometimes, and we'll talk about this a little bit, you know, we, we say to people that uh, we observe the Lord's Supper weekly. And I always maybe in an attempt to be clever, say, that's W-E-E-K-L-Y. We observe weekly, not W-E-A-K-L-Y. We don't want to observe weekly. Uh, we want to observe the Lord's Supper in a meaningful way, in a significant way, a way that affects us, affects our, our thinking as well as, as our actions. And so let's think about the Lord's Supper this morning. You remember that on the night before Jesus was crucified, he met with his apostles in the upper room somewhere in the city of Jerusalem. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him as, you know, as the night progressed on into the early hours of the next day. He'd be taken away and condemned to death and ultimately crucified. There are some things that he wanted to, to, to get done before those events began to happen. And so he meets with his disciples in the upper room. They meet together in order to eat the Passover meal together. But there are other things that he wants to address. And so he talks to them about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would come upon them in a few days. You remember they have an argument about which one of them would be the greatest. And at some point Jesus girds himself with a towel and takes some water and, and washes the feet of his disciples. And then in connection with the, the events of that evening and in, in connection with Eating together, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. So let's just read a couple of the accounts that we have in, in the Gospels. We're going to read Matthew's account and, and Luke's account. And you'll notice, maybe as we read these two and compare them, a, a few differences between the two, not in, not in substance really, but in some of the details that each one describes. And then we'll make some observations and we'll raise and try to answer some questions in our time together this morning. There are four accounts of the institution of the Lord's Supper. One in Matthew, one in Mark, one in Luke, and, and Paul gives one in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. John doesn't talk about the institution of the Lord's Supper as the other three gospel writers uh, describe it. And again, Jesus is in, in this upper room somewhere in the city of Jerusalem with his apostles. There's really, as far as I can tell, no indication that anyone else is there. I've read some suggest that there must have been some servants there or, or maybe some family members or something like that. But as far as I can tell from what the text actually says, it's just Jesus and his apostles. As we've said, they have met together to, to eat the Passover. That, that seems clear to me. And again, there's some discussion about that. But it seems clear to me from especially what Luke has to say in chapter 22 and verse 1. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. And in verse 8, Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. And then in verse 15, he says to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And so it seems pretty clear that Jesus sent them to prepare the Passover and express his desire to eat the Passover. And that was the reason they got together together. 
on, on that e- evening, at least as far as the apostles knew, that was the reason they got together. Well, Matthew's account describes the institution of the Lord's Supper like this. While they were eating, that's while they were eating the Passover, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so they're, they're eating the Passover together. And while they're eating, Jesus takes some bread that would have been involved in the Passover meal. And he makes some comments about that. He takes a cup of fruit of the vine, which would be involved in the Passover meal. And he makes some comments about that. Here's Luke's account, a little bit different in some of the details. But in essence, it's, it's the same. When he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so in Luke's account, you have Jesus taking a cup first, telling them to divide it among yourselves, making some comments about it, eating the bread and distributing the bread and eating it, and then some comments about the cup again. And so, you'll notice as we read this, and if, you were, if we were to read Mark, you'd see that Matthew and Mark are very much alike, and you'd see that Luke and Paul are very much alike. Uh, they, that is, Luke and Paul, they both note that a cup was drunk after supper or after they had eaten. Luke also says that the disciples are to divide the cup among yourselves before eating the bread. And the words spoken by Jesus differ somewhat in the two accounts, or the four accounts. In Matthew, the cup is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. But Luke says the cup is poured out for the new covenant in my blood. And so there, but the idea is the same, that what, what is contained in this cup, The fruit of the vine represents the blood of Jesus, which is poured out to inaugurate the covenant and which provides remission for sins. And so Jesus in this Passover meal uses two elements. And you remember there are several elements involved in the Passover meal. You can go back to Exodus chapter 12 and read about the Passover. It included unleavened bread. It included some bitter herbs. Remember they were to take a lamb and roast it. And they were to eat it, and so every family was to take a lamb. And if a family was very small and a lamb would be too much for one family to consume, they were to consume all of it. They were not to leave any uh, leftovers. They would invite another family, and so a small group would get together and eat this lamb. They were to roast it with fire. They were not to break any of the bones. They were to dress as if they were in a hurry, and they were, they were leaving very quickly. And they were to do all of this in the evening at twilight. And so Jesus is eating the Passover meal. And as he takes the bread, he doesn't give the traditional explanation of what the bread meant. He gives it a different explanation. This is my body. He said, I want you to eat this bread. This is my body. And as he takes the cup, he doesn't give what might be a traditional explanation for the meaning of the cup. He says, this cup, this fruit of the vine is my blood which is poured out for you for the remission of sins. And so Jesus is, in the words of Henry Alford, abrogating an old practice and instituting a new one. That is, he's bringing to an end the old practice of the Passover as it was described under the law, and he's instituting a new practice which would be observed in his memory. Remember, the Passover was done to commemorate the exodus of Israel from Egypt. And Jesus is instituting something new, which would be done in his memory as a memorial to him. And so, the Lord's Supper is distinct from the Passover, so much so that a Gentile in later years, a Gentile could observe the the Lord's Supper knowing absolutely nothing about the Passover at all. 
But he could observe the Lord's Supper and do it in, in just the way that the Lord wants him to do it, recalling the body of Jesus through the bread and the blood of Jesus through the cup. And so this is something new. Now, Jesus doesn't take all of the elements of the Passover. He only takes two of them, the bread and the fruit of the vine, and he institutes a new practice which would be observed in his memory. Jesus indicates that the disciples should continue to practice this ceremony or rite or ritual. We kind of hesitate to use those words sometimes because at least sometimes they have a negative connotation. We think of a ritual as something that you go through and you really don't even give any thought to it. You're just going through a ritual. <laughs> but there, there are rituals that we can go through and, and it'll be that way. We can think very seriously about it and very carefully about it. It might have a great significance to us even though we are going through a ceremony or a ritual. I, I really don't know what other words to use to describe it. But anyway, Jesus suggests and teaches that this ceremony should be continued after his death. The bread represents his body. The cup represents his blood. His body is given. And that suggests a sacrifice. He's giving his body for us. His blood is being poured out for us. And again, both of those terms, to give and to pour out, suggest that they're offered in sacrifice, which really hasn't happened yet. And so I want you to, to do this in memory of me, in memory of my body and blood, thinking about those things which I'm going to give. And so that suggests that this should be done following the sacrifice that Jesus makes on our behalf. And so they're to be done in memory or in remembrance of him. He goes on to say that he will not drink with them and eat with them until he does so in the coming kingdom. And so there will be a time in the future when I will eat with you, but not yet. It's going to be in the future kingdom. And so th th these things, the suggestion is, should be done uh, in, in the future by his disciples. And so it's really no surprise that we find 20 years later in the city of Corinth, people observing the Lord's Supper. Now we're going to talk about what they did. They did some things wrong in connection with the Lord's Supper. But, but Jesus teaches his disciples that this should be done it, it, uh, it continued to be done. This is not just something that he did for them on that night, but it's something that should continue to be done by his disciples. And so we do it today. Uh, here we are 21 centuries later, and we're still using bread to remember his body, and we're still drinking the fruit of vine to remember his blood, and we're trying to do that as he instituted it on that night. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul refers to these things as he addresses some problems in the church at Corinth. Uh, if Jesus instituted it in a, about A.D. 30, let's say, well, here we are about A.D. 55 or so, 50 to 55, and over that time, some serious problems had developed in connection with the Lord's Supper in the city of Corinth. And so Paul sets out to try to correct those things and address them. If you read down through 1 Corinthians 11, you'll find that the Corinthians had distorted the Lord's Supper so that it did not reflect the memorial it was intended to be. And as you read through the account, it seems that, well, it resembled more the pagan feast of the Corinthians than the Lord's Supper. And so devotees to certain gods, they would participate in feasts that were dedicated to those gods, and some of them were kind of raucous affairs. And so as you read through this account, it seems like they're observing the Lord's Supper in a manner that resembles more the pagan feasts than what Jesus instituted with his disciples on the night before he was crucified. They were divided. Some were eating. Others were not eating. Perhaps they were not even there. Later, Paul would say, wait on one another so that you can partake together. They had so distorted the Lord's Supper that what they were doing could not accurately even be called the Lord's Supper. And so Peter talks about that. Can't even call this the Lord's Supper because each one of you is taking his own supper first. Verses 20 and 21. Things were so out of hand that some were even getting drunk. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Here we are, supposed to be 
observing the Lord's Supper, remembering what Jesus did, remembering his blood, remembering his body. And this is so out of hand that some people are getting drunk during all this. Well, it's just, it doesn't even resemble what Jesus instituted. So Paul tells them that the Lord's Supper should be an occasion in which their focus is on Christ. Paul emphasizes in verse 20 and verse 25 that they are to, in the words of Jesus, do this in remembrance of me. And then you see it again. Uh, as often as you drink this cup, you do it in remembrance of me. And so Paul is telling them that they need to focus on Christ, remember Christ. They should examine themselves as they eat and drink. So verse 28, a man must examine himself, and in so doing, let him eat the bread and drink the cup. And they should discern the Lord's body as they observe as well. Verse 29, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly or discern the body. And so in these elements, we see the body of Christ. We see the blood of Christ. And so our focus should be on Christ. We should be examining ourselves, not eating and drinking to excess. It's a, man, it's a great big party, you know. And so we're examining ourselves. We're discerning the body. And we're doing it in a manner that really brings honor to the sacrifice of Christ and not dishonor. Well, having said all that, let's just raise a few questions about the Lord's Supper and try to answer them. So, so what is the Lord's Supper? Well, we've suggested this a number of times, I suppose, already. It's a, it's a rite in which Christians eat unleavened bread and drink fruit of the vine that is fruit of the grapevine in order to recall the death of Jesus Christ. It was instituted by Jesus himself on the night before he was betrayed, arrested, tried, and executed. When he instituted the practice, Jesus indicated that his disciples should continue to observe it. So it wasn't just a one-time thing, and no, they were to continue to observe this. And so we find disciples doing that in the New Testament, in Corinth, and in Troas as well, Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Well, what, what elements should we use in the Lord's Supper? Well, Jesus used two elements from the Passover meal, unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. And Paul refers to these two elements in his comments in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And you can see... He took some bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And so Jesus takes these two elements. Paul, of course, emphasizes that as well and institutes the Lord's Supper. Now, we know that the bread was unleavened bread because that's all that they were allowed to eat during the the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Passover was the first day of that feast. And so they were to eliminate all the leaven even from their house. And so we know that the Lord's Supper was instituted using unleavened bread. And we want to follow the example of Jesus in this matter. And so we eat unleavened bread in some form. I don't know that there's a particular recipe for the bread. But unleavened bread in some form is, is what we use following the example of Jesus and the teaching of Paul. And we use fruit of vine as well. Now, some religious groups use, use other elements. <clears throat> For example, the Mormons use water in their observance of the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> and, but, but that's a, a digression from what Jesus instituted. So, so we want to use what Jesus instituted and follow the teaching of Paul. Some use leavened bread. Well, Jesus uses unleavened bread. And so we want to follow that example without adding other elements to the Lord's Supper, without taking elements away, uh, without altering the elements in any way. You remember, God tells Joshua, I want you to observe the law of God, do what God commands, without departing from God's law to the right or to the left. And so that's what we're trying to do as we observe the Lord's Supper in the way that we do. Trying to do what Jesus instituted Trying to do what Paul taught. What is the purpose of the Lord's Supper? <clears throat> well, there's really more than one thing accomplished in observing the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, Paul says, As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
And so one thing we do as we partake of the Lord's Supper is we proclaim the Lord's death. We, we show our faith in what Jesus accomplished on the cross. We're not just saying that Jesus died. We're saying that Jesus died for these purposes. We believe that Jesus in dying atoned for our sins and shed his blood for the remission of our sins. And so we're proclaiming the Lord's death and what it means to us in observing the Lord's Supper. He goes on to say, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16, that in observing the Lord's Supper, we are sharing in or communing with or having fellowship with the blood and the body of Christ. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? And so we're communing with Christ. Sometimes we call it communion. Why do we call it communion? Because we're communing. We're sharing, we're participating with, with Christ and as we'll see with each other as well. So Jesus told his disciples to remember his body and blood when they eat. He said he would eat with us in the kingdom. And so we believe that Jesus is with us as we partake of the Lord's Supper. I will eat, I will drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so we believe that Jesus is present with us as we eat and drink. Now, he's not literally in the elements. And that's what some people teach, that the bread is literally the body of Jesus and, and the cup literally becomes the blood of Jesus. Now, that's not what we believe. But we do believe that Jesus is with us. And we're communing with him. And we're sharing in his body. And we're sharing in his blood. in the fall of the year, when Thanksgiving comes along, we, 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 my family, we all get together, and a lot of you know about that. We've done it for years and years. And so we get together, Thanksgiving, somebody cooks, and I think everybody kind of brings something and, and helps out. And we all eat together. And as we eat together, we, we, we uh, develop the relationship that we have with each other it becomes deeper, it becomes richer, it becomes more significant as we do those. Well, that's what we're doing with Christ. Our relationship with Christ as we commune with Him in the Lord's Supper is becoming deeper, it's becoming richer, more significant to us as we eat together. All right, and so the purpose of the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the Lord's death, we commune with Christ, and we commune with one another as we eat. And so... You can see again, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 17. Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And so we're all partaking of one bread, and we're eating together. One of the issues at Corinth was some were eating and others were not. And so Paul says, you wait for one another so that you can all participate together. And so we, we eat together, we eat the one bread, we drink the one cup. When I say that, I don't mean from one container. We're all drinking the same drink. We're all drinking fruit of the vine. It's not as though some of us are drinking the fruit of the vine and some of us are drinking water. Or, or some, well, we're all drinking from one cup. But we're all eating one bread. We're all doing it together. And so we, we're having fellowship together as one body as we observe the Lord's Supper and commune with Christ and proclaim His death. And so, a lot of things are being accomplished in the Lord's Supper if, if we stop and think about it. Now, the Bible does not say something like, and as you partake of the Lord's Supper, a special work of grace is conveyed and you receive the remission of your sins as you eat. Now, the Bible doesn't say that. Now, some people believe that. That as you partake of the Lord's Supper... That, that will provide for you the forgiveness of your sins. But, but that's not really in the Bible. And so we do several things. But again, some things have developed through the course of history that are, are a digression from really the simplicity of the description of the Lord's Supper in the, in the New Testament. Well, how often should Christians partake of the Lord's Supper? Well, Paul gives instructions in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26 that as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. But you know, that expression, as often as, doesn't provide with any specificity 
when. That, and then that's the equivalent of saying whenever you eat or, or when you eat this bread or drink this cup, this is what you do. We find out the specifics of how often from Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, where the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. To break bread in this passage, I believe, is a reference to the Lord's Supper. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, they continued steadfastly, the early disciples did, in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, and the breaking of the bread. And so to Christians, that expression, the breaking of the bread, or breaking bread is almost a technical term for the Lord's Supper because it recalls the actions of Jesus when he instituted it. He took some bread and he broke it and gave it to them. And so the expression, the breaking of the bread or breaking bread, even though that's sometimes used for an ordinary meal to Christians, we associate that with uh, the Lord's Supper. There's no account of individuals partaking the Lord's Supper outside of an assembly. And so the disciples come together to partake of the Lord's Supper. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is to be done when you come together. And so in the New Testament, the Lord's Supper is observed within an assembly or as a part of an assembly of Christians. The passage in Acts chapter 20 suggests the purpose of their assembly was to observe the Lord's Supper. Of course, they did other things. Paul preached to them, for example. But they gathered together to break bread. And so it seems that the central focus of their coming together was to observe the Lord's Supper. There's no indication in the New Testament that the church observed the Lord's Supper on any other day than the first day of the week. If you read Acts chapter 20, it seems as though Paul intentionally waits until the first day of the week so that he might meet together with the Christians in Troas to observe the Lord's Supper. And so early disciples met together on the first day of the week to observe the Lord's Supper. So that's what we do on the first day of the week. And every week has a first day. And so on the first day of the week, we gather together to break bread, that is to observe the Lord's Supper. Well, we might ask, are there any specific instructions regarding the procedure for observing the Lord's Supper in the New Testament. Any specific instructions? Well, I don't know that there are specific instructions regarding a procedure a church is to follow. Uh, For example, there's no indication in the Bible that the Lord's Supper, the elements, can be administered only by an ordained clergyman. Well, you know, there's nothing to indicate that in, in the Scripture. There's no indication of how much bread or how little bread a person is to eat. Eating more bread is not more meaningful than eating a little bread. (laughs) It's just not there. There's no indication that eating more is somehow better than just eating less. We eat enough to remind us of the body of Jesus. Now, the assembly should always be orderly. And we learn some of the instructions concerning the order of the assembly in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And he tells us in that passage in verse 40 that all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. And earlier, one of the things that he has to say is that in the assembly, one speaker at a time, you don't have different people speaking at once. No, you just have one speaker at a time. And if someone has something to say, he sits and he waits his turn. And so verse 29 The two or three prophets speak and let others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. For he can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And so in the assembly, yeah, that's that's allowable for more than one person to speak, but not all at once. You have a person speaking one at a time, and that way everybody can hear what's said and everybody can be instructed. And we might also say among the the instructions given for the assembly, verse 34, the women are to keep silent in the churches. And so, the way I've answered this question is this. An orderly arrangement should be made that will contribute to the purpose of the Lord's Supper, self-examination, discerning the body, proclaiming the death of Jesus, respecting the principles that apply to assemblies for worship. Roman, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, especially is what I have in mind there. And so, 
our time's out this morning. There are just a couple more observations about, about the Lord's Supper as we close. I'm not sure what the word is. It seems strange to me or maybe ironic to me that what was meant to be a simple action has been changed in such dramatic ways. So just think about this, these first century Christians. And what Jesus tells them to do is, I want you to eat some bread and remember my body. And when you get together, I want you to drink the, some fruit of the vine and I want you to remember my my blood. And so remember these, think about these early Christians as sometimes, you know, it, 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 meeting together as Christians in, in a group, or just being a Christian was not looked at with favor, and especially those early years. And so a lot of times you have these groups of Christians maybe meeting in someone's home or meeting in secret, meeting in small groups, and they're eating some bread and they're drinking for the, for the very simple way. And by doing that, they remember the Lord's death. But it seems that people are not content with the simple nature of the ceremony as instituted by Jesus. It seems to me if Jesus had instituted an elaborate ceremony with a lot of ornament and, and, and all of that, we'd be trying to simplify it. <laughs> if Jesus institutes something simple, we're, we're trying to make it more ornate. <laughs> you know? Just, just observe the simple practice that Jesus institutes here in, 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 on the night before his crucifixion. As is so often the case, people want to create a procedure that will produce a certain effect in us. The procedure that produces an effect. But what God wants are people who discipline themselves to think a certain way which will produce the result He wants from us. It's not the procedure that produces the effect. It's the discipline that we have in ourselves to think a certain way that will bring about the result that God wants. I wonder sometimes in a sermon like this if our discussion of all these details doesn't distract from the intent of the Lord's Supper. Oh, we get caught up in what day, how often, those kind of details which are important but sometimes in the discussion of those things, we're distracted from what we're trying, what Jesus intended for us to do, which was remember Him. Eat this bread and remember my body. Drink this cup and remember my blood. In doing that, we proclaim the Lord's death. We commune with Christ and each other. And so that's what we want to try to do from week to week as we observe the Lord's Supper. A very simple as Jesus instituted, very simple ceremony which deepens and enriches our relationship with Christ and with each other. Appreciate your attention today. If you're here and you're not a Christian, but you like to become a Christian, you have the opportunity to, re to respond this morning. If you'll repent of your sins having believed on Jesus and confess that faith, and if you'll be baptized in Jesus' name so that your sins might be washed away, you can leave this place right, right with God through His Son, Jesus. If you're already a Christian, but you're not right because of sin that's in your life, well, do what you need to do, whatever that might be, to be right with God as you leave. If we can help you in some way, we invite you to come as we stand and sing together.